right. Uh, thank you for having me um, in such lovely company. Um, it's a privilege and an honor. Um, and um, I'm sure this is going to be a really kind of interesting discussion. I'm, I know I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing what um, Shaka and Tina have to say. Uh, um, so we are living in what can be called a moment of kind of unprecedented mainstreaming of research ethics. An increasing number of countries and institutions have adopted ethics review boards. Most funders ask uh, you to address ethics in the proposal and get a permission to do your research, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And on the one hand, it can be argued that that's a really good thing. Um, every researcher should be thinking about um, ethical implications of what they do. Absolutely. But on the other hand, uh, the kind of review boardization of ethics has been critiqued for institutionalizing a very specific form of research ethics, and often it's called procedural ethics. Um, so procedural ethics focuses on doing no harm, which uh, if we simplify, it thinks uh, it can accomplish primarily through procedures of informed consent, um, confidentiality and anonymity. And these are fine principles, uh, but the premise that ethical behavior can be standardized and that risk can always be perfectly predicted is increasingly critiqued. Um, I've analyzed and condensed some of this critique in two of the handbook chapters that are up there on the slide if you want to kind of take a deeper look. Um, and I'm happy to send them to you if you don't have access. But a very brief overview is that there is plenty of evidence that, uh, for example, consent um, is not the panacea that it's made out to be, um, and that nobody can actually access future risk, um, that in some cases anonymization disempowers the already powerless and takes credit for their efforts, um, that full anonymity is questionable in the context of our current computational capacity, but more than anything that conducting ethics via forms that consist of checklists and that attribute to a project a status of ethical or not ethical in advance has serious issues. Um, so I'm not saying that ethics review boards are bad. I sit on one. Uh, I'm just saying that ethics uh, approval cannot be the last step uh, of ethics in a research project, but it's fine if it's the first step or if it's one of the many steps. Um, after all, as my friend and mentor Annette Markham has been saying since 2007, all methods decisions are ethics decisions and all ethics decisions are methods decisions. Now, one way to think about it um, is to say that research ethics is a particular sensibility that informs all of our choices as we are doing um, the research. My favorite uh, moral philosopher, uh, Mary Midgley, um, uh, says that creatures of limited power, uh, that's us, uh, need a priority system and a realistic map of their own capacities and weaknesses. So how do we come up with a priority system and a map of our capacities and weaknesses to follow it? Um, probably the most kind of notable response to the shortcomings of conventional board regulated procedural ethics um, is what I am calling contextual ethics here, but it's also very often called situational ethics and sometimes ethics of practice. So it focuses on the decision making in the unpredictable moments that occur when we are actually doing research. Basically, contextual ethics sees ethical research as a matter of responsible, context-appropriate judgment. So you decide what is uh, the most ethical course of action in each particular context. According um, to this priority system, uh, in order to make good ethics and methods choices, they need to be based on the particular research context. And I'm going to offer three possible ways to understand the research context. But depending on your research topic, there might be more or these might be different. Um, so first, I think uh, of the context that I study uh, broadly um, as people doing something on or with technology, usually in situations that are at least partially co-constituted by the internet, social media, or network communication technologies. So this means that when we think 
um, about ethics, we need to think about which platforms, apps, and devices uh, the context kind of is built on or happens on and with, which in turn invites questions about features and settings and governance, um, what the interfaces look like, what the buttons are called, what it invites us to do, what is uh, easy to do, what is difficult to do. So basically a conversation that is lately dominated by the concept of affordances. For the discussion at hand, uh, um, it becomes important to question not only what kinds of research do these technological contexts afford, uh, context afford, but also what kind of social life and behavior do the technological contexts afford? And what are the ethical and methodological implications of that? So what do people think and feel that they're doing? And thus, what are their reasonable and unreasonable expectations towards how the traces of their actions should be or could be treated? Another possible way to think of the context is to think of it in the kind of political economic sense, in which case we talk about the fact that these built spaces uh, where users concentrate and live parts of their social lives are owned by an increasingly small number of increasingly powerful corporations who can and do set rules for access and use depending on their private interests and not our public interests. So for our purposes, again, we ask, you know, what are the methodological and ethical implications of attention having becoming abstracted to a currency and platformization shaping social life to the extent that it does? We talk a lot about um, research having researchers having and not having access um, when platform companies can shut down their APIs, but we can also ask is, if platformization is marginalizing or making vulnerable new groups of people because of how platforms are governed or not governed because of how state surveillance or corporate surveillance is enacted via platforms, etc. And finally, we can also think of the context as sociocultural, even though it is technologically, economically, and politically shaped and constrained. So this guides us to think of social media use as a series of interactional or communicative contexts that we find ourselves in, instead of, for example, thinking of an entire social media platform as a coherent space. Um, or thinking of a, a particular app um, a, 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 or a platform as a coherent space. So this directs us to think of norms for particular communicative contexts and not whole platforms. So not Instagram norms, but norms for posting nude selfies or norms for commenting on people's depression posts. Um, now, trying to take into account and understand the social context of our research participants might be quite easy when we share something with them, an interest or political views or experiences, but it might be harder if we feel that we would never do what they do or we would never behave in ways that they behave. So going back to Mary Midgley again, ethics are hard because we are bad at interpreting motives which we don't fully share. So what do we do then? Um, well, uh, there is another kind of notable ethics, ethical priority system, which seems to be coming more and more popular among internet researchers, uh, which is ethics of care, sometimes also called feminist ethics of care or feminist ethics. So feminist ethics is essentially a relational ethics. It focuses on relationships rather than individuals, and in particular relationships of caring and being cared for. A relational ethics of care goes beyond avoiding harm and aspires to beneficence achieved through empathy and trust. So typically this care is practiced by adopting a deeply engaged, power mindful attitude towards participants, towards representing them in emancipatory ways, and in an ambition to give back to or be useful for the communities that we study. Ethnographers also recommend ethics of care, suggesting that the starting point um, are relations of trust and mutual respect, in addition to kind of just being mindful of unequal power relations. Um, this sounds good, right? Care, awesome. Uh, but ethics of care is not without its own problems either. So prescribing empathy raises issues of emotional labor, which is often gendered and can lead to commodification of and alienation from human relations, uh, human emotions. 
Ethics of care has been criticized as validating and trying to universalize a perspective of often white Western feminists and thus being patronizing. And finally, care is not as self-evident a term as it might initially seem. So does care in research setting, uh, settings mean provision of something that is needed for something to flourish? So we want to be caring or uh, care as serious and focused attention. So we want to be careful or care as anxiety and worry. So we actually want to be carefree. And if we mean care as being caring, then should we always attempt to care for all research participants? Can we be caring towards everything? I don't think we can. While it is common to see being caring as morally superior to being uncaring, is that always the case? And with this, I come to my last Mary Midgley quote of the day, where she says that we need to correct our idiotic optimism about choice because we are inclined to expect that we can always reject the idea of any real unavoidable choice of evils. In research, we sometimes have to make difficult choices and sometimes ethics of care might not work. And while in theory, situated or contextual ethics should always work because it is based on a particular context, I do feel that how we have so far operationalized contextual ethics by trying to focus on what the ethnographers call the emic descriptions of the contexts, uh, or how those involved in each particular social situation experience it, that might not always work either. As an example, we can imagine studying racist, sexist, misogynist, or criminal behavior on social media. There's a lot of it. Um, you know, when people threaten to kill or rape other people because of their ideas or practices or skin color or size or gender or sexual preferences or religion. Many of us might object to relying on those people's perceptions of the context to determine what is most ethical or would find it difficult to commit to deeply caring about them. I propose that in addition to kind of these two existing priority systems we've already discussed, which are care and context, we need to add a third one, which is critique or a critical focus. The latter means that we ask ourselves whether some research questions and some perspectives carry more ethical weight than others. That we acknowledge that while research ethics is definitely a matter of not causing people harm, it is also a matter of asking better, more socially relevant, more critical questions. Questions aimed at transforming the world towards a more just place. And that sometimes we do need to choose between evils, for example, between violating the trust of someone or not giving them the agency to choose whether they want to participate in a study and causing the society harm by not studying a specific topic or not studying it from a particular perspective. In the 80s, when Donna Haraway was writing about situated knowledges, she criticized what, was, what she called an analytical gaze from nowhere. And while contextual ethics and ethics of care have both been in different ways responses to universal ambitions of procedural ethics, I sometimes still feel that they're trying to articulate um, an ethics from nowhere. So mostly because when there aren't acute kind of conflicts of perspective, it is easy to forget that ethics is always from somewhere. If we as researchers uh, think the appropriate way to make sense of a context lines up with how the participants make sense of it, um, then, uh, sorry. Um, then um, it's easy uh, for us to think that uh, the priority system that we're using um, is perfect and kind of adv advocated um, for all situations. So maybe we can borrow from ethnographers and think of emic ethics and etic ethics or micro care and macro care. So micro care is care about specific people and macro care is care about all people. And these are quite clearly not always compatible. Um, and emic ethics, uh, we can think of as something that would be interpreted as adequate ethical and just research by the people and the communities that we study ethical for them from their perspective, or even ethical from our own perspective when we focus on the nuances of their social context. So ethics with empathy. 
And then there's etic ethics, which is something that we as researchers have the appalling responsibility to decide on based on what we think to, uh, to be of critical importance. And in each research project, we need to be able to toggle between the two um, to justify our choices between evils, to correct our idiotic optimism about choice, to arrive at a realistic map of our limited powers, and finally, a priority system that allows us to avoid wickedness. And with this, I'm done. Thank you.